Okay, well, thanks for the uh, introduction, and uh, I will be talking about breast here in my disclosures. So just in brief, why are we even talking about AI and pathology? Well, we know pathologists are too few in number, and we're all being asked to do more and more, and we're overworked. And much of what we do is relatively straightforward, but some of what we do is time-consuming, prone to inter-observer variability, and or prone to error. And AI can potentially address all of these issues and improve our work life. So taking a step back from the last presentation, how can AI help in the daily practice of pathology? Well, you heard some of that. It can improve workflow and reduce turnaround time, level the playing field by increasing accuracy and reducing inter-observer variability and bringing everybody up to a similar level. It can be used as second reads before final sign out to ensure clinically significant lesions have not been missed so it can provide a QA function. And it can do things we don't like doing or not very good at doing or are time consuming and do things we just can't do looking at slides on a screen or under the microscope. Now, to get right to the breast issue, um, this is a paper published by Judah Sandbank and MPJ Breast Cancer in 2022, talking about the development of the ibex galen breast algorithm. So this uh, talks about the development of this algorithm for breast pathology detection in whole slide images of biopsies. There was an internal test set and validated in an independent cohort, and it describes the deployment in routine clinical use. So how was this algorithm developed? Uh, it was based on a fully supervised, multi-layered convolutional neural network and specifically designed to classify and analyze whole slide images of breast biopsies. It was trained on more than 2 million labeled image samples from multiple labs, manually annotated by more than 20 senior pathologists. And the algorithm can identify 51 different breast lesions and pathologic features of invasive and in situ breast cancer and benign breast lesions. Here are the data from the internal test set. You can see that for the detection of invasive cancer, the AUC was 0.998, and for DCIS, 0.999. You can't get much closer to perfection than that. So that's the internal test set. Was this validated? Yes, it was validated on an external validation set of over 400 cases, and for invasive cancer detection, the AUC on the external validation set was 0.99 and for DCIS 0.98. So this seems to be uh, consistently uh, applicable. How does this work? Well, you saw an example of this in prostate. Here is an example of DCIS on the left with a focus of invasive cancer on the right. If we apply the invasive cancer heat map, it highlights the invasive cancer in red. We apply the DCIS heat map, it identifies the DCIS in red. So this is a very accurate way of identifying different lesions in breast biopsies. Now, interestingly, this same algorithm has now been tested on more than 3,600 cases from six different sites. And you can see that uh, most of these studies were done on biopsies, but the last study was done on excisions. But there's remarkable consistency in the ability of this algorithm to detect invasive cancer in DCIS with AUCs uh, ranging from about 9.8 to 9.9 .9 in all of these studies for both DCIS and invasive cancer. So what are the added benefits of using AI in the practice of breast pathology? Well, it can prioritize cases, highlight clinically important lesions within cases. It can pre-order receptor immunostains for invasive cancer in DCIS, thereby saving time. Pre-order additional levels, for example, if the algorithm is uh, um, able to detect calcifications, but there are no calcifications in a biopsy. It can order additional levels so you get those more quickly. Judith's study showed that it can eliminate the need for IHC in some cases because it gives the pathologist more certainty about the diagnosis. Can pre-populate reports, including synoptic reports, and essentially act as a super resident or super fellow, even for the residents and fellows in the room. You can have your own super resident or super fellow. And all of this will help reduce turnaround time, which obviously is very, very important. So then <clears throat> we know the algorithm is really good at identifying invasive cancer in DCIS. How can AI help in more problematic areas of breast pathology, particularly ibex scalin? So we're gonna focus on invasive ductal versus invasive lobular carcinoma and the identification of microinvasion in cases of DCIS 
If you want to hear more about Ibex Galen's ability to quantify HER2, there will be a seminar like this one tomorrow at noon. So let's focus on invasive ductal versus invasive lobular carcinoma. Well, many of us as pathologists don't think that that's much of a problem. We can tell lobular from ductal carcinomas, right? Well, the fact of the matter is when you look at data from clinical trials, it's not so straightforward. These are two large clinical trials that included large numbers of cases of invasive lobular carcinoma. And among cases diagnosed as invasive lobular carcinoma at the original institution, in these two studies, only 60 to 66% of ILCs were confirmed on central pathology review. So pathologists do have a problem in reproducibly and uh, reliably diagnosing invasive lobular carcinoma. So how does Ibex Galen do in this? Well, pretty well. Uh, in 153 cases of invasive breast carcinoma, the distinction from invasive ductal from lobular carcinoma had an AUC of 0.97, quite good. In a follow-up study from uh, Hartford Hospital that was presented here last year using the same algorithm, looking at 180 cases of invasive ductal and lobular carcinoma, the AUC for the detection of lobular carcinoma in distinction from ductal carcinoma was 0.94. So again, this algorithm is really good at doing this. Here's an example of a core needle biopsy with an invasive carcinoma. And if you put on the invasive cancer heat map, as you saw in the prostate, the areas of cancer are highlighted in red. But the Galen algorithm also has the ability to tell you whether it's more likely to be lobular or ductal. And if it's lobular, it will be in blue. So we go to that part of the heat map, and we see that the cancer is highlighted in blue. And at high power on h &E, you can see that this is clearly an invasive lobular carcinoma. Now, we recently did a study on the identification of microinvasion in cases of DCIS using this algorithm. This was presented by one of our fellows, John Su Caracas, at, um, uh, as a poster yesterday. And in this study, we looked at 147 slides with DCIS from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Champalamo Foundation. Rita Marks, who's the senior author on this uh, poster, uh, provided those slides from uh, Champalamo. 85 of the slides uh, had microinvasion, 62 had only DCIS, but these cases of DCIS were, these slides with DCIS were selected from the same cases as cases with microinvasion. So they essentially act as, uh, each case acts as its own control among those cases. And I have to tell you that these cases were biased toward really difficult cases, because when we were selecting these slides, John Su and I were sitting around looking at slides, and I think Rita did the same thing, saying, okay, the algorithm will never get this. So we were trying to bias it toward problematic cases. In addition, the slides were scanned on, stain, uh, scanned on two different scanners at these two institutions. And I think it's important to remember that these slides were evaluated using an algorithm that was trained to detect frankly invasive cancers. It was not trained to detect microinvasion. So what did we find? Well, we found that the algorithm detected microinvasive foci with a medium to high likelihood in 83.5% of the cases, which absolutely blew me away when I saw these results. Moreover, among the 14 cases with microinvasion considered by the algorithm to be low likelihood of invasive cancer, after we as pathologists reviewed these cases, the algorithm had in fact highlighted microinvasive foci in all but two cases. So really the the algorithm was able to identify microinvasion in 98% of the slides with microinvasion. Here's an example of a case of DCIS with microinvasion. You can see on the left an H and E stain section with DCIS on the left side and invasive cancer or microinvasive cancer on the right. And you can see that the invasive cancer heat map highlights this focus of microinvasion. Another case of DCIS with microinvasion, I think it's probably really hard to see the microinvasive focus on the H&E stain section, but if you look carefully at the area highlighted in red by the, by the heat map, there is a focus of microinvasive carcinoma. I don't know why my, it's up there, trust me. Um, now, in all honesty, the algorithm also identified microinvasive foci in five slides missed by the pathologist and categorized by the pathologist as DCIS only. So that's a real oops. But I have to say, I don't feel too badly about that because in these cases, microinvasion had already been identified on other slides. 
So here's an example of a microinvasive focus missed by the pathologist and picked up by the algorithm. These are the kinds of cases that we all have nightmares about. We have DCIS involving lobules with extensive lymphoid infiltrate in the stroma. Uh, when the invasive cancer algorithm was applied, there was a little area of red highlighted by the algorithm. And at high power, you can see that this corresponds to a minute focus of microinvasion. Now, microinvasive foci are minute, but this is a minute focus of microinvasion. So what's the future of AI and breast pathology? Well, the future is now, really. AI can provide improved accuracy, efficiency, and consistency for specific defined tasks like prioritizing cases, diagnosis and grading. We didn't talk about grading identification of lymph node metastases, quantitating histologic features and biomarkers, pre-ordering receptor stains and levels when necessary, and pre-populating reports. In the longer term, the AI algorithms will become more sophisticated and do things we currently can't do, and that's where there's going to be real added value. But ultimately, what we're looking for is integration of clinical, radiologic, histologic, biomarker, and genomic data to create a comprehensive computational pathology profile for optimal diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So I thank you for your attention.